Neil Morissetti, uh, it's great to have you with us for this talk. Uh, obviously, you work with us and we work with you. Um, but tell us a little bit about your, your uh, full-time job. Um, what are you doing now? And tell us a little bit too, please, about your background. Okay, certainly, Nick. We start actually with the background because I think it probably sets the scene for what I'm doing now. Um, I come to all of this after about 35 years in the Royal Navy. Um, when I was at sea, I was a surface warfare officer. Back in uh, dry land, it was either in headquarters in Portsmouth or in London in strategic planning and uh, horizon work. Um, my so last senior jobs were the command of the UK Maritime Forces, so I was the one who took the fleet to sea. And then I ran postgraduate education for the armed forces at a time when the impacts of a changing climate was starting to come up on the agenda. My last job in the military was one working across Whitehall as the UK government's climate and energy security envoy for about three years, trying to explain to others around the world what security implications of a changing climate were and what we needed to do about it, both from a security community perspective and wider. And from there, I moved across to the Foreign Office to work for William Hague, who was then the Foreign Secretary as his special representative from climate, from climate change. For the last five or six years, I found myself at University College London with a role to bring academics, principally in the science, technology and engineering field, and policymakers together to ensure that the research the academic community are doing is relevant to the challenges of the 21st century, and that the policymakers factor in the work from the academic research in a fashion that informs their decisions. I still remain engaged in climate change and resource issues, principally from a security perspective, through Chatham House in London and in Washington in the CNA Military Advisory Board, both think tanks. Well, as we are now in lockdown and with the pandemic upon us, um, this obviously is a pandemic is a, obviously a global challenge risk um, that is, you know, must have been on the horizon of a lot of uh, risk planners for a long time. But now it's upon us. How, how do you view the virus now it uh, and the pandemic now it is upon us and, and, and you know, across all sp uh, domains and spectrums uh, from social and, and political? I think the scale of the pandemic has come as a bit of a shock for everybody. Um, people have looked at and talked about pandemics, they talked about uh, flu pandemics and other issues, but I don't think anyone realised quite the scale and the impact it would have. In a world that was already pretty challenged, uh, long before we'd even heard of coronavirus, um, and I think it's exposed some of the underlying weaknesses, but it's also exposed some of the strengths of society. Um, which we might be able to use that, what we've learned in that area in the future. Um, the weaknesses are clearly it shows that some populations are more vulnerable than others um, and have struggled and are struggling to meet these challenges along with some of the other challenges they face whether they're food, health, demographics or, or, or whatever. Um, it's also exposed the limitations of a just enough, just in time society. And that's perhaps more pertinent to us in, in the developed world, where we have reduced our stocks, whether they be for food, uh, materials, or PPE, to an absolute minimum. And we've had to work incredibly hard to try and catch up and manage soaring demand in certain areas. Um, we used to talk about like, warehouses on the riverside, they're now on the high seas. And it really is just a day or two's worth in, held in, in, in various organisations. So that, that's exposed it. Um, I talked about the strengths of society. I think that's particularly show, so at the local level um, where we've seen communities come together. And many of the challenges we're going to face when this is all over will require local action as much as national and international action. Um, technology. If we see what technology has done, uh, in, in a phenomenally short time. It's really impressive. The, he the headline ones are clearly things like um, Mercedes Formula One and University College London's team with the CPAP, but there are many others. Um, the logistics organisation, I mean, if you look at what things like various health organisations around the world have gone from supplying perhaps a few hundred sources to many thousands now. Um, far faster than I thought it would happen, although perhaps not as fast as some of the media did. Um, 
if you look at you know the area I, I'm in, in climate change we've seen a huge reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the last few weeks which is very good in the sense that it's um, improved the air quality so there's less issues of respiratory health concerns and others but it's also exposed perhaps some of the narratives that others have talked about of trying to resolve all this very quickly the only way you can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions as dramatically as you, we can have done is by shutting everything down and clearly that's not viable um, so we're going to have to work harder at looking for alternatives and drawing on all the breadth of skills in, in society, whether it be technical or um, social. Susie, do you want to come in? Um, you you mentioned the impact of the of climate change, and what are your thoughts on that in terms of key natural resources such as food or water or land? If you could explain a bit about that, please. Yeah, I think there was pressure on, in fact, there's been pressure on food and water and land for a long time as the population of the world has grown so dramatically. And so, um, you know, 7 billion gusting 9 billion puts a lot of demand, particularly when in many of the communities, it's not just an increase in numbers, um, people are living longer, more but also it's an issue of increased aspirations. Um, and the challenge that climate change poses to that is that we either end up perhaps with reduced yields, for example, um, if you have one degree overnight, one degree centigrade overnight rise in temperature, that knocks 10% off rice yields. And um, we've seen the impact of extreme droughts in wheat harvests or extreme wet periods, um, both of which we saw in 2010. And at the same time, we've always talked about the management of water being one of the great strengths. We've avoided water wars, etc. Um, I'm not sure that as the pressure grows, unless we improve our management of water, um, we're going to be able to retain that state of affairs and we will need to work harder in those areas. The real difficulty is that there are a number of countries around the world which are particularly vulnerable, have resource challenges, food shortages, water shortages. But they also have health problems, they've got demographic issues, um, parts of the world where we've seen conflict in the past, either between states or more often within states, frequently because the governments haven't got the capacity and the resilience to deal with the challenges that their societies face. And that really acts as a sort of stress multiplier. Well, although climate change is a global problem, the physical effects have mainly been felt in those same countries. So it's a bit like pouring a bucket of petrol on a smouldering fire. It's inflaming the situation and it's acting really as, as a threat multiplier, which is increasing the, the risks of instability, not just in those areas, but further afield, depending on whether people are moving or whether people are trapped because they can't move. And therefore, in order to find a livelihood or, or an income, they're susceptible to organised crime or even in, in some instances, extremist funds, extremist organisations, like Boko Haram, AQ, um, Al Shabab, and others. Neil, it's been incredibly difficult um, for many people to get climate change on government's radar screens to take it seriously. Progressively, that has happened, and as we've seen, you know, from um, the the protest movement and Greta Thunberg uh, and and, um, and the like that uh, climate change is at last on, um, on, on, on people's agendas and very much so, but it, it's, it's a slow moving catastrophe. Um, I wonder whether with the, the pandemic upon us, there will be a mind of governments to take climate change more seriously than they have hitherto, um, given what we have uh, suffered and are experiencing now, which is something akin to a wartime environment. You kind of hope so, don't you? Um, I think it's going to be challenging because what you're describing, in my mind, is a, a long-term strategic issue that needs governments to make decisions now which will come to fruition and hopefully the benefits way beyond their term of office and in some instances beyond their, their lifespan. Um, and we're a society that is perhaps more immediate, more short term in our vision. Um, we've got used to certainty. 
we've got used to relatively low risk and we've got used to an immediacy of things happening when we want them to. Um, but I'm hoping and this, that because we're now living in a world that is more uncertain, it is riskier and things aren't happening as quickly as perhaps we would normally expect it, but we're getting used to that, that we would be prepared to look beyond just the challenges of COVID-19 and as soon as that's put away, we can go back to life as, as usual and start to argue, well, what are the other issues out there that need addressing? Um, and there are many challenges, but I would suggest climate change is up there at the front, if not the most important one, one of the most important ones. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that if we're back to Bill Clinton, it's economy stupid and we've got to sort that out and there'll be a lot of pressure to sort that out very quickly understandably because people need jobs they need a livelihood in order to have an income in order to look after their families wherever they live in the world um but i think what we've got to do is we've got to work um across society to get the message that we are prepared to make some changes if it means that we can avoid a re repercussion or, sorry a repercussion of what we have seen in COVID-19 in the way of disruption of society. Um, and I think you may be aware that the, the UK Climate Change Committee has already decided to delay one of its reports <laughs> while it looked at how we can develop future in it, the future economy in a, in a low carbon clean tech fashion faster than we have been doing in the past because we do need to do it quicker. Um, the challenge is it's going to need all of society. Um, everybody's got a part to play. Governments clearly set the framework. Um, and then the, both the commercial sector and civil society will have its part to play in, in, in coming up with the answers that are going to reduce the risk posed by a changing climate. Just sorry, before Susie comes back in uh, now, I've got a quick supplementary to that, which is that given, the, given the penalties, given the pain we're experiencing now, do you think there will be an appetite to put climate change on the radar? Or will we be so busy addressing the fallout from COVID-19 that climate change is just going to gradually slip off that radar screen? I think there are two issues we need to consider here. One is the, the narrative or the story that's been told. If we simply say, right, okay, that's COVID part, let's now talk about climate change, that's going to be as bad or worse, so we better bloody well go and do something. I don't think you're going to take people with you. If the narrative is about the fact, look, we've been through a challenging period and it's shown us what will happen if we don't act. Perhaps that should give us more impetus to act on climate change. And by the way, in doing so, there are a lot of opportunities. There are opportunities in the sense of reducing the risks to our health because of cleaner air quality. And we saw that uh, during the economic shutdown. Um, there are opportunities in the sense of stable fuel prices because we're generating our power from renewable sources. There are opportunities to reduce the risk of conflict around the world and instability. So a narrative, there's going to be a narrative that's, that's positive. At the same time, it can't be one that talks about doing it all very quickly because we know if you try and do it in the next two or three years anyway, you can do this by stopping doing things, there are no substitutes yet, so we've got to look to provide substitutes for societies in order that they can continue to enjoy a lifestyle which they find satisfactory. That actually is relatively simple, although I don't underestimate the challenge in the sense that there are good storytellers around who can tell that story in various communities around the world. I think our bigger challenge is the capacity of our elected representatives to deal with this issue, with all the other issues that go on at the time, and the pressure they will come under for certain sectors in society for an immediate answer and an immediate solution. So there's, there, is, there, is, there is more to do, but there's no reason why, if we draw on the strengths of the various sectors of society, um, that we can't come up with solutions that will help address the impact and reduce the risks. There's always going to be some risk in society and we cannot remove all the risks posed by a changing climate. But we've got to understand where society is most vulnerable and what we need to do both in the way of adaptation and in mitigation, in other words, reducing emissions. Um, 
to reduce those risks to those elements of society. Brilliant, thank well, you. Given, given, our, given our experience Thanks, of the virus sir. so far, I mean, what do you think is the, is the public appetite for adapting or changing our behaviours? Well, in one sense, it, it's quite good timing because there are some of the things they may have to change and they do, they haven't been doing for a while anyway. So travel is an example. Uh, and particularly air travel. But as I said, they'll only do it, I think, if they can see an opportunity or an advantage in doing it, or they are forced to do it. And it's unlikely that many governments are going to force people who've just been through COVID-19 to carry on not travelling or not um, doing certain things and it simply because they're a problem that is perceived to be many years ahead. So that there's a, there is, it comes back to this narrative and this willingness to invest in a story that can be illustrated with examples. So in the same way that we saw Formula One, Mercedes and the university producing technology which helped people, I am sure there are lots of sectors of high tech industry who will be able to provide alternatives over, in a relatively short period to the way we do things. Now, some of this already been done in the sense of um, the energy sector. We have generated far more power from renewable energy than we, than we had in the past. And we're showing that by developing storage capacity and batteries and this sort of thing, we can, we're not into the case of we only get power when the wind blows and the sun shines. But the next sort of challenge we've got to face is our homes and how we reduce our emissions from our homes, whether they are new homes, which in a sense are easier because of, of, of the building, if we get the building regulations right. Um, but also retrofitting in old homes. And again, I think there is a lot that the technical sector can offer for, for, for countries like our own, but also it's a sort of, some of this technology can be can shared around the world uh, with other countries to ensure that they don't, for better way of putting it, make the same mistakes we made over the last 150 years. Um, similarly with transport, we, we can provide transport that doesn't create as many emissions, therefore as many health hazards as uh, traditional fossil fuel powered cars, whether it be petrol or diesel. It is going to need an investment um, and it's going to take time and it's going to involve everybody. And again, and I sound a bit like a warm record here, the story has to be upfront and honest, explaining what the challenges are, talking about what the solutions are, what the benefits and the opportunities are and the storyteller has got to be somebody who the audience can relate to. Neil, uh, COVID-19 has shown what we do when we're minded to um, act swiftly. Um, turning that same attention to, to climate change and related global challenges, big structural global challenges what sort of solutions do you think sectors can bring to bear both individually and by cross sector cooperation to attack some of those larger challenges that you've been um, discussing climate change food and water security uh overcrowded cities even um yeah any lessons from what we've seen being transposed uh, to those sorts of challenges I think the sort of lessons that we should learn from are those that show where collaboration, perhaps with strange bedfellows or people who haven't collaborated before, work. Um, there are those who have an understanding of what the problem are. So, for example, in the context of climate change, many of those are NGOs and others working in the developed world who understand the detail, plus the local uh, um, population. There are also those who are able to look at what the research opportunities are and the benefits of, or, or rather what we could possibly do, what is technically feasible, and there are those who can make it. And it's going to need all of those. Um, some, of, some of it, the solutions are actually relatively simple. The story I always tell is discussion with the, water, the Pakistani water minister who was getting rather bored with development agencies digging him wells when all he wanted was two places at Edinburgh University to do water management. And it could resolve a lot of problems. 
So that's where you need the local knowledge. Um, I think if we look in the developed world, we've got a lot of the high tech industries who may well find themselves in, in lean periods. Um, aviation is a good example. Flying is going to take a long time to get back to where we were beginning of this year. Um, that means there's going to be fewer aircraft required new ones, and there's going to be fewer aircraft that are required to be serviced under contract or whatever. There is scope for that industry to use its expertise, but perhaps with a new sector, talking with a new group of academics or new research community, and also new customers. The important bit will be for them to get each party to get confidence in the other one and to understand how what they can offer fits into the picture. And on occasions, it will need to be incentivized, um, maybe by governments or by people accepting new norms, um, all these new partnerships. But that's where the real opportunities will come. And with it, of course, comes a restoration of the economy which keeps chancellors and, and, and treasury ministers and financial ministers happy. Um, and also you know, the building back of, of businesses, which ensures jobs, ensures sh dividends for shareholders. So it has the potential in that area to become a win. It has the potential in the, in, in the local communities when they start to see the benefits. We may have to compromise on things like intellectual property and this sort of thing. But provided the story that is being told explains that this is a win-win, then I think there's a willingness, and, there and we have seen signs of that willingness during this COVID um, pandemic to, to just change things the way we do things slightly, or, or in some cases, a, a major shift, but recognising that there's a benefit in doing so. Susie. I mean, you talk about the, the role for the aerospace and defence sector and about the need for um, genuine partnerships. Um, a, a humanitarian spokesperson I spoke to recently said that they thought the most the, the key to unlocking this was trust, transparency, and a genuine long-term commitment. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And speaking in plain English, French, mm -hmm. German, Arabic, whatever it is, Chinese, Cantonese, Mandarin, um, so everyone can understand what we're talking about. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. This has got to be a strategic partnership. This is a strategic threat. Like many 21st century threats and challenges, we need to look for new 21st century solutions. And the manner in which we deliver them will be a 21st century process, not a 20th century one. And Neil, when it comes to uh, procuring solutions, I mean, these are big architectural global problems. So I wonder where you think the buck stops in terms of procuring solutions. Are we looking or should we look to supranational bodies or are we looking to individual governments cooperating with industry and academia to get these big um, solutions in place to these challenges? Ultimately, these are global challenges, but invariably, the answer to addressing them lies at either regional or local level frequently because the challenge the specifics of the challenge and the problem are more regional and more local within a within a global piece um, that doesn't mean that you won't have multinational or for example a uk company working with an american university delivering something to africa or to asia but i think more of it will be on a regional and local basis Ultimately, national governments are responsible for their citizens and their well-being, um, and they have responsibilities. But as they work in their regional bodies, be it the African Union, the European Union, the ASEAN grouping, uh, or the Americas, or whatever, we've got more chance of success because there, there tends to be a greater commonality of, of thinking and understanding. Quick supplementary, if I may, which is Susie just touched on the role of the aerospace and defence industry. Of course, one of its gifts is that it does act as a systems integrator. And just as we've been talking about the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the need for an overview um, from a sort of procurement pers perspective for these challenges, um, the great gift of aerospace and defense is that it can stitch together solutions in this systems integration role. Um, 
do you see that as a strength that has not yet been exploited um, in tackling global challenges? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think you know, a number of my American colleagues have talked about the need to have the equivalent of a space program to tackle some of these challenges. And that uh, the point you make about the integration piece and bringing together all the strands in, in, in a manner um, that, that it, it could be effective and achieve the objective we're setting out to do, which is, as I said, in my mind, is to reduce the risks that these challenges pose to society. Um, for some of it, the aerospace sector, yeah. For some other sectors, or in some cases, it, it's governments. In some cases, it's it may be a major global NGO or something, something like that. I, I mean, I don't think it's a one size fits all, but undoubtedly, a, a systems integrated such as the aerospace sector is well positioned. And actually, you know, some of the companies have had, have had huge experience. They indeed they were involved in the space program in the past. Susie. Well, I, I was. I mean, this is again just a supplementary thing, and it's following on from an interview I did yesterday, which is. Um, one concept that was raised is that the, one of the impacts of the coronavirus is that, that nations become more inward looking and more reluctant to connect because we're all having to isolate and nations themselves are closing borders and isolating and it's very hard to keep the infrastructure of technology and um, resources going on in a post coronavirus world or a world where long term we may be very restricted. But do you think this is something that AMD can, can surmount? Well, I, I think you've put your finger on a real challenge. You know, we were becoming more inward looking anyway. And there is a danger that some nations at least will become very introvert and um, particularly if they perceive threats to their borders, including as we saw in 2015 in Europe with people and the movements which may or may not be bringing diseases um, and all of those challenges. But then you get a multinational company that crosses the borders and a multinational organization, a global organization that will deal with those issues and get on with it, provided we can keep trade routes open, provided we can keep movement of goods open, uh, the ability to share intellectual property and knowledge. Um, then I think they are well positioned to assist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Neil, uh, lastly, as we, um, as we move towards um, closing here, um, we've talked about transparency and trust. Um, I wonder what you feel aerospace and defense could do to uh, leverage more transparency and trust across the world if it wants to elevate itself to this new role of not only systems integration of solutions with other sectors, but also in supplying technology of its own to address some of the big structural global challenges that we've talked about. Um, I think it's got to be humble. I think it's got to be open. I think at the moment some of the sector is struggling because people are perceiving them as being closed and not providing the full picture. Um, and they will need to address that. But I think they have also, by demonstrating what they can do, um, they will strengthen their case for being part of, and in, instance, in some instances, leading in some of this activity. So I don't think it's straightforward for the sector, but I think what the sector can offer is so great at a time when I think they'll have capacity, it's in their interest to go the extra mile and engage with the other parties in what is required in this process. Um, and as you say, build up that trust and transparency so that the others feel comfortable working with them and sharing the benefits. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a great note on which to end. Uh, Neil, uh, Susie, Thank you both very much.